apologies for the short delay that some of you might have just experienced. Welcome to a special Australia at Home tech talk um, where we are zooming in as part of the NetThing conference, which I've been dipping in and out of over the last couple of days. Now, we've kind of got two audiences coming together at the moment, the um, Australia at Home crowd who are part of a project that we've been involved in since the beginning of the lockdown. Um, and we do regular talks to bring people together, share ideas and try to get through this strange and confronting time. And our net thing crew, who I know are deeply engaged in the topics we're talking about today. So I'll explain how we're going to spend the next hour in a moment and introduce you to my wonderful partner in crime, Lizzie O'Shea. But before we get there, I do just want to um, pay respects to the traditional owners of the land where I am, um, the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation, and join with you wherever you are around Australia in paying respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, and recognising the land we're all on was never ceded. So we've been sort of, I guess, beta testing away, Lizzie, of talking about technology um, over the last few months and what we call the fortnightly tech talk. Um, and we've been doing it through the Australia at Home platform for those that are, everyone knows Zoom, the way we like to play is to turn your cameras on actively use the chat and we have very much a two-way conversation with the with the audience rather than talking at you this is not a webinar um, and what we've been finding when we've been talking around technology issues is that it's a great way of kicking really complex ideas around from different perspectives i think we're in a world where um, there's a whole bunch of different traditions of thinking about the um, technological change coming together at the moment. There's some of you that have got greyer hair than mine that have probably sort of come through the tradition of the internet as a transformative technology. There's a cohort of you who I think Lizzie's an ambassador for who come to it maybe inspired by the ideas of Assange and Snowden about the way that the internet can challenge traditional state powers. And a Johnny come lately, like myself, who really comes at it more from a perspective of interrogating the ideas around surveillance capitalism. And I know they're all Venn diagrams that cross over, but it feels to me that the really interesting discussions we have in this forum are bringing those traditions together and challenging each other, um, interrogating each other and seeing if we can come up with a common language for some of the, the challenges and also the opportunities that confront us when it comes to technology. So the framer of today's discussion is really to talk a little bit about, I guess, big picture, what the web is and what the internet is in Australia. And what Lizzie and I are going to do is run a, almost like a, a facilitated discussion with all of you, um, going through a number of questions that we thought might be interesting to, to explore today. So while I put those questions in the chat, maybe do you want to introduce yourself, Lizzie, and say hello and make me stop talking and then we can get into the discussion? Oh, I, I, I'm very happy to make you stop talking, Peter. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm Lizzie. Uh, you, if you've been at NetThing um, already, then you would have seen me speak in one of the earlier sessions yesterday. Um, you know, Peter talked about I guess different generations of people, not necessarily by age, but how they maybe have come to understand the internet and what it represents in their lives. And I think the other way to perhaps think about it is also as cross-disciplinary, this kind of discussion that we have uh, definitely brings different skill sets um, on a pretty regular basis and different lenses for understanding the problems that we confront in the digital age. So um, I am a lawyer uh, is my day job, uh, but I'm also the chair of Digital Rights Watch. So I like to think of myself as someone who sees, maybe Maybe because I'm a hammer, I think everything looks like a nail, but I like to think it through the lens of law and understand how laws influence people and look at it from that perspective. Um, but I also am a member of civil society and advocate strongly on a range of different issues using um, my hat uh, as Digital Rights Watch. Uh, I'm also a writer, so I've written a book about um, some of these topics too, uh, which covers you know ideas of surveillance capitalism as well as state surveillance and other kinds of things. Um, but yeah, that's the idea 
idea of these talks, I suppose, to try and translate some of these complex topics in technological terms into uh, a common language that can be understood not just by engineers, not just by journalists, but also uh, members of the public who are perhaps interested in how the rules that we make are shaping our digital environments. Uh, and I'm really keen to hear from you guys. Um, often we talk about topics of the day, but Peter and I were talking about how this is a really interesting audience that comes to NetThing and we really wanted to hear from you about some of these topics as well, which is why we've kind of structured this session to be definitely interactive and designed to solicit participation from you as a um, knowledgeable community who've thought a lot about internet governance and how we can move into a, um, a more flourishing, exciting 21st century uh, and confront the problems that we face, but make the most of the potential of the internet. Um, and so hopefully that's what we'll get out of it today. So you should very much feel encouraged to participate and tune, chime in whenever you whenever you can you, you we might need to find you to unmute you but um it shouldn't be too difficult and we, we do that pretty regularly in our tech talks thanks lizzie i should probably introduce myself as well so um lizzie's the lawyer that sees um i think that you know when you're a lawyer you see everything like a nail i'm a political campaigner i've run a company called essential media for the last 20 years running all the fights from industrial to environmental um civil society uh, i stumbled into the politics of tech about 18 months ago. I also wrote a book, not nearly as good as Lizzie's one, but it was really just a rant about how I, I felt that the, the world had been transformed by technology and we'd lost our human agency. And I was really exercised by the political project, project of building a public conversation around how we harness technology for our mutual benefit and it not just be something that happens to us um and what i found when i was going out talking to people was there was a huge appetite for this conversation and everyone brings a lived experience to it whether you're a parent with kids who are addicted to their devices whether you're um somebody that's despairing of the the failure of our body politic to deal with you know disinformation and fascism um, and also whether you're someone that just sees the massive potential of human connection online that's being frittered away so it's been an interesting journey and you know I've loved stumbling into a world where there's so many people with amazing ideas and great um, banks of knowledge and history with this and and I always feel like I'm a kid in a candy store just learning new stuff in every discussion so particularly for those of you who are old hands at this please participate today what we were going to do is almost break the discussion into four quarters and do these four topics that I put in the chat policy inclusion security in the future and Lizzie and I will start off maybe with a little bit of a, of a discussion started with each of these questions, but we really want to bring you in. So please actively engage in the chat as we go and make sure that this is not just two people talking at you for the next hour. So Lizzie, question number one, and I'm going to throw, should I throw to you first? I think that probably sure, makes sure. sense. Mm -hmm. So this is this setup that um, I guess a starting proposition that I don't, again, is open to discussion that the, what we used to call the World Wide Web actually is no longer, and it's becoming a series of closed networks that reflect different national cultures, closed but poorest. You've got the Great Firewall of China. You've got the hyper-capitalism of the States. You've got a rule-based system emerging in Europe. And the really interesting question to me is, are we creating a web, an Australian web as well, and what can that look like and what values does that reflect and how will that shape the way that technology operates in Australia? So that, and I'll, I'll drop a link into an article I wrote on this a, a few months ago, but while I'm doing that, Lizzie, not my, you know, challenge my thesis if you like, but I'm also really interested in, in your thoughts on what is the most Australian thing about the, the web as you, you see it today. 
Sure. So uh, just to give you a little bit more framing, the four areas we chose are actually the themes of net things. So that's kind of what we were riffing off. What are the things that we're at net thing to talk about? Well, here's four of them. Uh, and if we leave some open ended questions about it, that will hopefully get us to think about these things um, more carefully and, you know, stuff that we may have learned from sessions in the conference, but also you can pitch in as members of the audience. So I feel, um, you know, a bit despondent sometimes when I think about policy in an Australian context because uh, one of the key absences from the Australian legal system is a Bill of Rights. And I think that leaves us extremely vulnerable to all sorts of tech policies that don't respect people's privacy, uh, that don't respect other kinds of rights, um, like public participation, um, and all, all, all the different forms that they might have, um, have become evident over the course of, uh, you know, over several decades of human rights law, since we had this first instrument, the University Declaration of Human Rights. You know, we are the only Western nation, uh, the only liberal democracy that does not have a Bill of Rights as part of our legal system. And I think that means that we sit distinct from uh, countries that we consider very similar to ours in terms of culture, in terms of politics, in terms of legal systems. I think it's a real problem that we are diverging from those systems because we don't have instilled into our legal system a Bill of Rights. And there's all sorts of practical ways that takes uh, hold. Uh, but I think from a policy perspective, we'd make better policy, particularly with respect to the internet, in my view, if we recognised the critical value of human rights as a driver, as a lens through which we can make policy. And unfortunately, I feel that's what makes um, us distinct in terms of internet policy as compared to our neighbours. I'm perhaps less optimistic, I suppose, than Peter might be about this issue. Well, I, I guess I, I'm with you to a, an extent. I guess my optimism is the work that's being done within the Australian Human Rights Commission and Ed Santo, the commissioner in particular at the moment, where he is, to the extent Australia has anti-discrimination values embedded in law, attempting to create a framework that embeds those principles into the development of future AIs of significance, both government and commercial. And that seems to me to be quite a transformative idea and probably quite a distinctly Australian idea. And talking to Ed, part of his thinking is that if we get this right, we actually can create um, a Australian notion of what AI is that embeds Australian values of non-discrimination into the design to contrast with the products being made in other parts of the world. Yeah, uh, look, you know, I'm not saying that a Bill of Rights would have necessarily stopped um, things like, say, um, robo-debt from happening, which I think is a design problem uh, that's, you know, clearly um, making use of technology in a really poor way to further disempower people that, that uses um, poorly thought through um, machine learning design and algorithmic design. Um, and I don't think we're necessarily going to catch all these problems before they take form. But I do think it is important that we put at the centre people as rights holders rather than people just as users or people that we impose technology upon, that actually people have dignity and they have an entitlement to, be ex to expect that they not be treated as objects. They're subjects um, that they've got the right to demand a certain kind of base level of treatment. And that takes, you know, that means that, that decisions made about them by a machine need to be think, thought through very carefully before they're implemented. And I'm really glad that Ed Santo has been taking this initiative to think through really carefully in what circumstances, um, you know, we should be uh, in, being very certain about the need to import anti-discrimination principles into algorithmic design, for example, and that's very necessary work. But I wouldn't want to assume that that necessarily happens. Like, I do think laws are important. They set minimum standards. They um, they they shape government thinking. They, uh, they create a, a cultural change in how departments might execute policy. Uh, so I, I think that sometimes they can be lofty and feel inaccessible but in Australia its absence is real and we can feel it in the carelessness sometimes of government uh, and in the dismissal of, of sections of the population it's interesting someone raised in there the digital divide um, with, you know what's distinctly Australian well we have um, I was actually going to bring Paul up if he wants to have, oh, yeah, a, have a go yeah. nice segue Sorry, are you there Paul that. absolutely yeah hi there so so look, the, the one of the things that uh, Australia suffers with, which uh, is very much uh, uh, affects the internet as much as it does other forms of, of transport and physical uh, you know, togetherness, is the uh, the broad 
uh, regions of nothingness in the middle that uh, separates ma many of the centres of population, and also the sense of um, loneliness and uh, the distance for people in our reg regional and rural communities in terms of how far away they are physically from a lot of services, from their neighbours, from education. Yeah, that is the situation that gave rise to our school of the air, not internet-y, but very much using communication technology to do distance education in a way that uh, in Australia worked so much better than uh, you know, other forms of doing things because uh, that was a way of overcoming distance. Uh, in Australia now we have this MBN thing and for all of its uh, faults and failings, uh, you know, one of the things from right from the very beginning that that had was a focus on bringing communications to regional and rural communities. Yes, it's satellite. Yes, sometimes it's fixed wireless. It's, it's not as good as fibre, but uh, for many communities way out in the remote bush, for many uh, indigenous communities, uh, for many country towns and farms on thousands of uh, hectares of, of, of land where it's hours to get to the next nearest neighbour. It, was, it brought communications in a way that they didn't have before at all. And uh, while we think, you know, fast is better than slow, uh, even slow is better than nothing at all. Uh, and that is a very much a, uh, a problem or an issue that is, uh, I think, uniquely Australian. Uh, maybe Russia has uh, similar thing. You know, you look at any countries with vast amounts of uh, land area, maybe Canada is probably the closest other nation with the same sorts of issues that have had to be bridged to bring more equivalence uh, to uh, capability and uh, empowerment to people in country and regional rural areas uh, compared to the sorts of uh, capabilities and privileges that people in the middle capital cities enjoy, such as being able to sit on a video conference with 84 other people and for the most part have it uh, not clag and, uh, and blow out on us. Yeah, it's good. Um... Thanks, Paul. Sarah's got a comment too, something uniquely Australian, the she'll be rights attitude. Were you there, Sarah? Yes, um, I guess from my perspective, it's just looking at everything in general and it's technology, both infrastructure and policy. We're just like, oh, she'll be right, we'll get over it. You know, it, it's not gonna affect me, why do I care? And that's the biggest bit that I care about is that, you know, we should care and we should be demanding more and better from you know, our policy makers and our infrastructure builders, we should be demanding better in general. Mm. I couldn't Thanks, agree with you more, Sarah. I, I also think one of the things about the NBN that's so obvious, the tragedy of it really, is that we could have had a, a proper NBN built many years ago and it takes something like this, this pandemic, um, to crystallise that actually building this infrastructure when um, perhaps uh, you've got the time, the resources, the energy to do it will serve you well in moments of crisis. And this idea of she'll be right, um, I think is can be very careless and it allows you to, to put off uh, the inevitable necessity of spending on this infrastructure. And I think if we thought about Australia as a place where everyone ought to have an entitlement to be connected to the internet because it is so much part of our lives. It's how we communicate with each other. It's how we talk to our, our representatives. It's how we understand um, the important issues that are shaping our country it's an essential part of public participation if we understood it in those terms we may have faced less of this uh, opposition to investing in the infrastructure necessary to allow everyone to enjoy that equally rather than uh, disproportionately favoring those who end up in the key cities on the seaboards mm. the, the tragedy lizzie is way back at the very beginning it very it very very quickly turned into an economic oh. argument so you got people with no imagination and no ambition talking about the dollars it took to build it and not really talking about the uh, even the economic benefits, the dollars that would be unleashed by having this sort of under, underlying fundamental infrastructure. Mm. The, uh, the conversation, because it was very political, turned into a very oppositional thing. And so you got this huge focus on needing a business case and you can't put a business case on people's ability to communicate. You can sort of kind of put a business case on things like healthcare. And I, I distinctly remember uh, back in the day, the opposition poo-pooing the idea of using the MBN for telehealth. And yeah. guess what? We've got the same group now trumpeting a decade later. Oh, this network thing, it's really good for telehealth. We can do telehealth during COVID. Well, guess what? We could have done telehealth before COVID as well. And it would have been just as valuable for great segments of the community and create a lot of very 
economically quantifiable benefits, but there was this focus back in the early day for uh, poo-pooing the idea of a business case or having no ambition about the sorts of capabilities that this would unleash that would have ultimately created far more uh, benefits and, uh, and prosperity for so many people compared to uh, just think of it in uh, the, the dollars it takes to construct terms. Mm. Do we want to use that as a segue into our second session for the, the group, which is really around inclusion? And I think, I think, Lizzie, we mean this in the broadest sense of the word, but what's the one thing we could do to improve inclusion? Yeah, I think this is a really um, good question because inclusion is a big part of the conference and I think it's a really important issue that we need to improve on because unless we do, I think the internet's going to be built for a certain cohort of people that isn't representative. So I suppose what the, the one thing, one thing, this is probably stretching that definition a little, I think we need to diversify who's in the room when we're designing things, both who's doing the designing, but also who we're designing for. And I think the time is over that we design... Um, product just for the median person being usually the white man and we need to start thinking about designing for all users and indeed prioritizing thinking about the most vulnerable user in particular uh, and there's lots of ways that can take form but there was a great story it's not a great story it's a terrible story but a really fascinating story that um the folks at Digital Rights Watch saw this week and we put it on our Twitter, I'll post a, um, a link in a minute, but it's about a woman who's taking a bar exam in the United States, something I have a lot of empathy for. Fortunately, I don't have to take a bar exam because we don't do it, but in the States, it's a very rigorous process. You do three months of study minimum, kind of seven days a week, and then you have a two-day exam. And she has to take that exam using software that uses facial recognition to ensure that she's not cheating. But because she's black, she has to sit under an extremely bright light. So otherwise the facial recognition algorithm thinks that she's cheating, that she's left, that she's done something else. And to my mind, that really highlights the fact that we roll out this technology so often uh, and we expect it to work for everyone when it's really actually been de designed for a specific segment of the population. And it's unacceptable. It's, it's going to entrench forms of discrimination already within the legal profession. We have an underrepresentation of people who are from non-white non backgrounds, obviously of women as well. And it's a tragedy to my mind that someone's introduction induction into the profession would be through an experience like this which just suggests we're not doing our job properly I, and I think it highlights the real dangers of, of, um, of having to um, of rolling out products before they're ready um, I don't know if I said but essentially she's got to sit under this terrible light um, and she only worked that out because others who'd taken it with her realized that that's what you would do it's not as though that the, the the company itself recognised the problem and sought to fix it. These people are having to find their own solutions and that's really not good enough. Um, so I think it's an interesting story. That's how we can fix it, I think, by thinking much more carefully in the design stage. Get rid of this idea of move fast and break things because really what that's saying is someone else will have to pick up the pieces. Actually, design things from the beginning with an idea of a diversity of users, a diversity of experiences, actively bring those people in. As Cheryl says, that's really an example of poor design. Um, I guess for me, the other side of the argument is the um, the design brief at the start. And, you know, the reality is that the majority of technology advance is being designed to maximise profit. Um, and so the design principle that's at the start of that process is how do we make the most money out of this idea? Um, we had a really interesting discussion at the Australia Institute um, on Wednesday with Robert Elliott Smith, who's written a fantastic book, some of you may be aware of, Rage Inside the Machine. Bob's an um, AI scientist who's looked at the broad implications of his work and has reflected on, you know, the theories around what he calls the edge of chaos, which is that the the profit motive is driving technology down a path of more and more refinement, more and more targeting of an outcome, which is very much a financial outcome. And what needs to be done to create more robust systems is to actually embed broader design principles at the start around broader public interest. And it, it's interesting because it isn't well attuned to a pure capitalist system. Um, Ironically, I imagine that the technology being rolled out by the Chinese government will be substantially different. Now, I'm not saying it's, it, it's not a set of values that I subscribe to, but 
it shows that the design principles at the start of a piece of technology are as important as the idea of what the end user at the end of that process is as well. And that's where I think it's really interesting to have a public conversation about the parameters of design before technology just sort of rolls over us. I'm very curious, um, you know, Philip's put a comment in there. Oh, sorry, no, it isn't. It's, uh, sorry, someone above that. I think it was Sandra who was saying, you know, we've had universal design principles or principles that don't just prioritise profit, say, um, to put it more specifically in the way you were just talking, Peter, um, for a long time. And universal design is obviously a movement that is widespread. It's interdisciplinary. There's lots of people within urban design who think really carefully about this. I must say we still fail in urban design principles, so I'm not sure why we think we do necessarily better in technological Heck, ones. Yeah. But I'm kind of curious to know why it is people think, because I'm sure we've got engineers in the room and um, people who do that kind of design work, why these problems keep happening. Because it's 2020 and uh, the rollout of a facial recognition tool to take bar exam seems like a no-brainer to me that you would check that that worked before you rolled it out. Um, but it, it just keeps happening. And it, it does suggest to me that there's a deeper problem in how we politically, philosophically think of these issues. And, you know, I, I often think, I wonder, I suppose, whether um, we need to have more interdisciplinary learning through engineering um, and through the process of, of design, we ensure that, the, that um, other forms of learning are embedded into our development of people who do this work um, and in that training process. But there may be other reasons as well. And I think it's probably a cultural um, idea that, that, that when you're building something, those are things that other people consider not you and I wonder whether that's true and if people in the audience have anything to offer. Yeah, um, Philip had a really interesting discussion. Are you there, Philip, to come online? Otherwise, I'll start. Oh, there he is. Yeah, I, I like to lurk and put my comments in the chat box, but yes. <laughs> um, well, I'm that's just... on you now, Philip. <laughs> yeah, it is. Look, this is something, uh, is one of my pet things about what does professionalism look like. I mean, if I go back 15, 20 years when I was uh, president of the Australian Computer Society, I would just rail against this sort of stuff that you have to have, tr what does trustworthy people, processes and systems look like? It's, it's, you know, they work as expected. You don't have nasty surprises. Um, you meet people's expectations, but professionalism at its most fundamental involves this public interest element. Um, and people were un have been unable to distinguish between a, uh, a very high quality technician and a professional. And I use the example of robotics. You can have two people programming a robot to move you know, a glass from A to B both can program the robot to do that, but a professional will say, uh, what sensory faculties are built into this robot? Let me check that before I do that, I won't hit a human or I won't knock someone's block off. And you program that in and it's that uh, awareness of the need to uh, build in and bake in, um, you know, the, the social mores and to imbue your robot or whatever you're building with appropriate value systems so that the way it behaves reflects the way we humans expect it to behave. Um, I mean, it should adapt to us, not vice versa. And that's missing. You know, I mean, we talk about good UX is the sort of technical term, a good user experience. That takes a lot of effort. But if it's not valued, it won't be provided. And quick and dirty um, is what people want to pay for. And they, un until they don't like it, they're willing to put up with complete rubbish. Um, and that's unfortunate. We shouldn't let them. But for as long as there's a market, the capitalist system says, if people will buy quick and dirty and put up with, you know, 80% is good enough, that is what people will build and deliver. And that's what's happening. And it's, you know, as I say, I'm a bit of a lone voice. Um, and, you know, I'm a, a Virgo, so people hold that against me. But, um, yeah, look, this is a really important point. And, but we are, I'm afraid, in, in the minority in demanding it. If people stop and think they agree with you, but they say, but no one's willing to pay for that. And I, I also wonder, Philip and Lizzie and everyone, the extent to which 
the idea that we've almost got a reverse market now where the front end of a lot of services are free and the cost is hidden is actually distorting this this notion of what value is as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I guess, you know, look, the freemium model, you can say, is, is to some extent contributing to that because the overhead is obviously then loaded into those who pay the premium. Um, but if you take something like Zoom, you know, which we're all quite happily using. I mean, it, 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 its freemium model actually worked. I mean, you got people used to it. Um, I, I would say there'd be a million people around the world in the last six to ten months who've um, discovered Zoom at the free end and have upgraded once they got used to it to start using it. So there it works. And, and to their credit, they have been very agile in building in the security that people said was missing in building in a whole lot of features really with a fair bit of alacrity that Microsoft is struggling to build into Teams. You see it every day. They're you know running about two months behind Zoom with everything. I mean yes they test it more and all the rest of it but it's a really it's a very poor equivalent. Um, yeah, I mean, I, if I can jump in, I mean, there's some interesting comments coming up in the chat talking about, I saw Terry there talking about data quality and what data we use for machine learning and AI and the like. And um, I think this does raise some kind of deeper philosophical questions as well, because, you know, you're right, you're, you're right, Philip, to talk about, um, also, I'm a Virgo, and so you're not a lone voice. I also share your view that we need to uh, agitate on this issue, and I don't th I think there's many in the room who wish. So I think it's a growing co cohort of people who think this is unacceptable. But also, like, it reminds me of um, that Stafford Beer quote that the purpose of a system is what it does. So if you've got a system that was designed to, to be cheap and dirty and, and cheap and, and the um, institution doesn't want to pay for a properly designed one, then you will get what you pay for. Um, but I think we can start to hold others to account. We can say, oh, well, governments shouldn't buy those kinds of products. They shouldn't be investing in them. They should be investing in ones that do work and we hold them to account when they don't. But there is a deeper philosophical question when we're talking about data quality there. So if you're um, talking about optimising, say, pretty policing algorithms, the data set that you're going to be training that on is the state's response to data. So you're going to be optimising what police have already done, using that data set to train an algorithm to do something. So I think there's kinds of biases that might exist within uh, the data set that then the algorithm gets trained on, for example, which can import those uh, biases, even if you're doing your best because to, to modify for them, because the purpose of that algorithm is to do something different than perhaps what we might first think. Uh, and I think that's important to remember. There's, there's so much of our data that we collect in the real world. Like, I don't know whether people have read Invisible Women, for example, which is a great book, which just maps out all the ways in which women are missing from all these standardised data sets. And so it's going to be a massive effort to try and correct for those biases. And uh, I don't think we will get it right every time, but I think at least approaching the question with intention uh, and, and also um, creating a, a culture of penalty when you do something wrong uh, will start to edge us towards, I think, better design, better technology and an accommodation for biases that might exist in the data sets as well. Um, Holly um, had some reflections on the notion of free. Um, are you there, Holly? Do you want to have a couple yeah, of words? I think I'm reflecting what everybody else said. We're all getting used to free. And what um, if you go back to the digital platforms report, what they talk about is a double-sided market. So what gets, set, what gets put in our face is so-called free. And what we don't realise is what the cost is, is our data. And it's our data that is being flogged and used and abused uh, by the platforms so that they can actually get money from the advertisers. And we bunnies who think we're not paying are in fact paying. It just doesn't, we just don't hand over cash, that's all. Yeah. Um, and we're so used to it now, you know, there, there's all these, you know, we're, we're trapped on two levels, aren't we? One is we're used to free and also we're trapped in network effects now where the cost of moving to a different platform means losing connections right. and losing things that have been established. So um, that's, we are absolute, in this... that's, that's deliberate. You know, I mean, don't yeah. think that's that's not incompetence. That's absolute and, and By that's design. incompetence. That's yeah. Competence. Yeah. Um, 
Thanks, Holly. Lizzie, we probably should move on to the, the next part of our little structured discussion, interested in people's view on security. Where is Australia's biggest technological weakness? Yeah, well, we started this conversation and I was going on about the importance of a Bill of Rights and I think this is where it comes to the fore. I mean, I'm going to say something that probably everybody will have predicted, but, uh, you know, we at Digital Rights Watch strongly opposed the encryption legislation. Uh, I don't know why you would in the 21st century allow uh, for actively for weaknesses to be imported into encrypted systems uh, because it puts uh, systems at risk. It's very difficult to contain those weaknesses once they're created. It's hard enough to contend with unexpected weaknesses. Deliberately creating them seems like a recipe for disaster. Uh, and the fact of that bill, the fact that we've now created the capacity for the national security stage to deliberately import weaknesses into our encrypted systems, I really do think that relates back to the Bill of Rights. Um, we, or the lack in Australia, we're the member of the Five Eyes that doesn't have a Bill of Rights. And in the United States, forcing a company to write code, for example, uh, would probably be considered in violation of their First Amendment because it's a form of forced speech. Um, um, and we don't really even contend with that. We, we had a very uh, uh, short period through which we, can, we thought about this legislation that, you know, there was a widespread opposition from civil society organisations. I'm sure many of the people in this room contributed to various um, uh, proposals and submissions about why this legislation was bad and it still passed. And we're now contending with the consequences, including um, reviews uh, and uh, the the relevant parliamentary committee is still considering it, but a, a scathing review from, in many ways, from the independent national security legislation monitor who's quite critical of the bill and the need for it to be changed, or the law, I should say, the need for it to be changed. And I think even the opposition now realises that. I, I sort of wish they hadn't passed it if they had such concerns about it, um, but I'm glad at least now they're proposing for it to be reformed. It's a, it's a terrible shame that that's happened. And I would like to think that um, we wouldn't let it happen again. And uh, we as a community hopefully can learn from that and, and do better next time and, and work harder next time and, and have a broader coalition of people who now understand these issues and why it's important to them as everyday people. Um, and as not, not necessarily with, you don't need a specialist interest in the internet or the politics of digital technology to understand why these proposals are bad. And I hope we'll be able to defeat it next time, but it's very disappointing to me. And that's the biggest issue I think at the moment facing our security. Paul very politely put up his hand and no one ever does that on Zoom. So you get the mic again, Paul. It's, it must be the privilege of being on screen one of four uh, yeah. that, actually, that actually got seen. Um, Libby, <laughs> I think one of, one of the issues with the encryption laws on Toller in particular is I actually don't think it would have mattered how, many, how much civil society or how much the population jumped up and down. Uh, it's a national security thing and it's alignment with uh, international partners. It's bipartisan support from both both sides of government uh, where they differed was ear twinking teetering and twinking around the edges not they, they both agree that they uh, that we need some of these laws to uh, fight the four in internet horsemen of the apocalypse pornography and and child abuse um, and trying to keep keep people safe from things that they consider bad even if nobody else does uh, but it, in this, but that particular example, I don't think it would have mattered how much we mobilised the population. Uh, those laws were still going to get passed. Uh, all that we could really hope for, and what we actually did, is uh, get enough noise marked about it to get some of the worst edges knocked off. But uh, the the fundamental principle is still there, and it got passed. So when the next thing comes up like that, the only real hope we have of affecting real change. Uh, is if it is a topic that doesn't have bipartisan support from both major parties. I personally think we don't have enough competition of political parties. If we had five roughly equal powers, then, uh, then hey, then we could have some fun. Hey, can I push back a little bit on, and it's, it's not a necessarily a, an encryption debate, but I, I heard you say that, you know, that, that the setup is the government determines pornography is bad or child abuse is bad or whatever. There is a real issue um, around the way that the technology has been developed, particularly the way the platforms operate, that our kids are being exposed to both addiction by design, disturbing content. There was the, the suicide video that just went viral on multiple platforms last week. And I think for those of you that come from a world that government regulation is verbotum, we need to find a way of dealing 
with these problems. And the rest of our society, kids under the age of 18, get protected. They, they're not allowed into pubs, they're not allowed to gamble, but it's a free for all. And the response has been, it's all about giving kids agency and parents tools. It just doesn't work. And if there is, I think, a hot political, um, you know, kitchen table issue that will really derail a lot of the, the, the thinking, I think that you guys support, it is that. Oh, sorry, I'll unmute you again, Paul. Sorry, Matt. No, sorry. I, look, I think you're right. I think the, the issue is how much we imagine that that is a solution that can be fixed by technology rather than by encouraging correct behaviour. The Part of that whole thing comes through from a desire by the people that use the technology for good, for immediacy. The only way to really fight the uh, availability of pornography, of the suicide video, of the uh, live streaming of the uh, massacre in New Zealand is to have human moderators watching everything and hitting the approve button before anything gets published. Now, can you imagine if we had human moderators that had to look and, and explicitly approve every single tweet that was sent out? Does but it need to be that binary? Like, it's like saying, you've either got freedom of movement or you've got a police state. No, we have a world where there's freedom of movement, but kids aren't allowed in certain places. Like surely if we have the greatest engineering brains working on this network that um, is generating the world's greatest ever profits, we can actually look at this as a design challenge. It's, it's, it's not a human, it's not a technology issue. It's a human issue. Uh, talking about uh, having minimal data sense for doing machine learning for someone like Facebook and the platforms to have developed a machine learning way of trying to recognize um, the New Zealand uh, atrocity, they would have to train it on several thousand or million similar videos of people shooting with a webcam, shooting down the barrel of a gun. Uh, and then that would still not pick up atrocities being committed by knives. It's not a technology issue. In that sort of a case, we don't have, and will never hopefully ever have, a suitable library of example sets to try to train a machine learning uh, video on. It's ultimately something that engineering is not going to fix. It actually requires the superior uh, capabilities of a human brain to actually recognize things. And that in itself is extremely problematic for the poor guys that are, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of people that are already sitting in the back of rooms having to visually approve the things that the uh, machine and getting completely traumatized by it. But mm. expecting a technology solution for that is, uh, is completely unrealistic. I totally get what you mean, Paul, except I think there are two ways of looking at the problem. So, you know, there's, there's uh, uh, to add fuel to your argument, you know, video for police accountability, for example, has been critically important in building the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, that kind of video contains violent and abhorrent material. You know, I talked about this before yesterday and, you know, it potentially risks if we're going to classify material before we publish it. It does have the capacity to reduce one of the greatest things about these platforms is that gives us the ability to talk, um, speak truth to power of sorts, and it gives everyone that opportunity. Having said that, I do think there are things that these platforms can do to limit the way in which they profit off addiction, um, the way they um, encourage polarization as a result. Um, there are different ways in, we can't, um, we can't just assume that the platform has to uh, therefore do nothing. We can talk about limiting virality, we can talk about stopping micro-targeting, we can talk about, talk about um, the responsibility to not automate things like advertising categories that might allow you to, for example, advertise to anti-Semites, which, you know, at one point was possible on Google. You know, there's all sorts of ways in which I think we can be, we have to be quite careful to avoid letting the platforms off the hook as well. Because at the moment, in my view, something like Facebook um, benefits greatly from huge amounts of unpaid labour by people who lovingly moderate their particular Facebook group um, and make it a nice place to be. Uh, and then there's a whole shadowy workforce. Someone posted about the cleaners in the chat, which is a book that goes into this issue, who are traumatised by having to um, moderate content as it comes up. Uh, and those costs are just like diffused onto those people. That's not something that eats into Facebook's profits. So I think we do have to contend with 
with the potential design questions that these platforms do have responsibility for, while also very actively, I think, making sure we preserve the best bits about these platforms that give the capacity for people to be able to freely communicate, speak, um, collaborate online. Well, now we've solved that one, let's go into our final question <laughs> of our little speed date with destiny. Um, the future, what technology, Lizzie, are you most excited about? I find this very hard to answer, I have to say. I mean, look, I'm excited about everything. I wrote a whole book about why I'm excited about the potential just of excited, the web. Yeah. <laughs> I am very excited and I, I do think, um, you know, I worked for, uh, to touch on what I just spoke about then, I worked for Witness for a while, which is an organisation that looks at using video for justice and um, the explosion of that capability in the digital age is pretty incredible um, and being able to document police violence particularly is pretty profound and um, it's really remarkable how differently we treat these topics when we can see them, when we can identify with people who are experiencing Experiencing this kind of violence and we can document it. So I am very excited about that potential. It's a grim kind of reality being able to see the true horror of what people experience on a daily basis, but from it you can build a form of solidarity, you can organise in ways that can be effective and hopefully you start to turn these issues around um, and, you know, take back some power. So I am very excited about those kinds of um, that kind of potential that's inherent in these platforms. And that's why I, I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, but I absolutely think we need to fix how they work and that the profit motive that drives a lot of the problems that you were talking about before, Peter, is a huge part of it. And so these really are platforms that are more like utilities that people treat like utilities. I think we should think about regulating them in that way rather than just simply as, um, as a, you know, space where you, you socialise with your friends and, and it's, it's, it's somehow separate from a political environment when it's not. Mm. Yeah. Well, I was thinking about this and the, the, the platform we're on at the moment is actually what I've found most exciting, particularly through the lockdown. I feel that when we're in a meeting like this and all our cameras are on and we're sharing ideas in the chat and talking backwards and forwards, it feels like we're in the internet, not on the internet. And it reminds me of some of that sort of early thinking around the web from guys like Benkler about the idea of a shared common space. There's no surveillance capitalism going on. I know there's concerns about um, some levels of security on Zoom, but as far as I've been able to tell, they're not going to be micro targeting me a tech talk because we've sat here talking about technology today or a parents filter if they got deeper into what we were talking about um we've been adapting this on a lot of groups in civil society we're doing constituent briefings for mps conferences for all sorts of orgs we're running a five-day conference for kids with disability at the moment where yesterday we had the producers and stars of crip camp this fantastic doco about the disability movement in America, just jumping on and talking to these kids in a workshop. So that sort of idea of co-creation and then building connections that can flow out of it, I think this, this platform particularly has excited me and filled me with real optimism through this horrible period that we've gone through. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's what I vote for, which is kind of voting for what we're doing now. Um, I, Terry. Say if I just wanted to add one more thing but before you get Terry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, which is I do think this does give you greater empathy with people who might have been experiencing disability before this as well, because we're all required to work from home, we have to find new ways to communicate and it's not always possible to do that in person. And I think it's really interesting insight into, you know, people said at the start of this pandemic, oh, if you're homebound because of disability, then this gives you a good insight into what it's like. And it opens up spaces that would otherwise not be available to people and they're easy, easily forgotten you know pre-pandemic life um, and in fact we should take that with us um, to the post-pandemic period the idea that you can participate fully in life even if you are required to stay home uh, and that maybe you can't access the physical spaces there's still lots of ways in which we can work um, to include people like that and I hope that's um, something that we carry with us mm. into this next phase. Yeah and that notion that forced restraint has forced us to come up with workarounds and the workarounds actually create value that we would never have discovered without the forced constraint in the first place. There was um, Terry had a whole list of things that he's excited about so I thought if we're going to end this on an up we should give Terry a crack and then um, oh, anyone Terry. else that would like Save oh, the okay. day, please. indeed well um I think the two things there I've mentioned is um quantum entanglement I think that's going to be 
very interesting because if we want to do um, communications on steroids, if we have um, these split particles they talk of in quantum entanglement where you can then exchange information with that you know, pair anywhere on the planet, anywhere in the solar system, that's how far the reach would be on, on that technology. That would actually enable huge amounts of communications. It wouldn't matter where you were. You could, you could buy your entangled pair device, leave one at home on your broadband, and then just the other one's in your phone, and you just walk around, you're just using internet no matter where you are. You could be in orbit, you could be on Mars, and your internet would still work. So quantum entanglement's extremely exciting. If they get that working, it's gonna be absolutely amazing. Now, the other thing I mentioned there is quantum Boltzmann machines, and that's, that is a uh, machine learning AI technology that is being widely discussed because it's taking what we do now with machine learning and putting it on a quantum computer, and able to process at such a high speed and high bandwidth that we'll end up with something that starts to look like one of these science fiction AIs. The ability of, you know, not just you know, a thousand states and a thousand features worth in your ML model, we're talking about, you know, maybe a million, maybe a billion features in your machine learning model, which comes very, very close to simulating human neural activity, comes very close to uh, processing uh, things in real time that humans are able to do right now with our parallel processor up here, the, the meatware, we call it. We, we, can, we can turn over two or three things per second, but inside that neural network, it's doing billions of transactions per second. And if we can simulate that, then we're talking about what the, the holy grail for AI is, that's a general purpose AI that can essentially talk to you, have a personality, uh, even start to become self-aware. And I suppose that's the other thing that's very exciting about QBS. Is that exciting or scary? It's exciting and scary at the same time. I can guarantee you that. I'm we, terrified. Well, right you, should, you should be terrified because look, if, if we can raise our kids, most of our kids get raised to be fairly reasonable citizens. We should be able to do the same thing with our AI, shouldn't we? Wow. That, this is a discussion for another week. Um, I reckon, just yeah. blown my mind. Yes. Um, Teresa had a few ideas there, things that um, you're excited about. Hi, yeah. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah. Thumbs Hi. Up. Good. Cool. Um, yeah, look, uh, I think it, look, there's lots of technology I'm excited about, but the thing that excites me most is when we see initiatives that actually get somebody connected that wasn't connected before. And this is really basic. So during the pandemic, we got MBN to offer free connections for vulnerable households um, who were trying to educate their kids. Unfortunately, this is going to finish in January there's still going to be an ongoing need. So we need to really focus on the 2 million households that are not connected and affordability is a part of it. Absolutely. Um, I had one more bit of excitement. Give me another thing you're excited about, Lizzie, while I'm looking up and unmuting our next. Well, I must say the other thing that comes to mind in this context and maybe this is more likely to be sympathetic crowd to this thing i am very excited about the moves in silicon valley um, but other parts of the tech industry as well uh, among workers within the industry to start organizing uh, around not just their own workplace uh, and protecting vulnerable workers within those workplaces but also around the decisions that are made by their companies so um you know, things like working with immigration and customs enforcement in the United States. There's a lot of workers at companies like Google and Salesforce, um, other kinds of te large tech companies, Microsoft and the like, to stop uh, their companies working with them to target migrants. Um, and a lot of these projects that people think are pretty alarming around using AI technology to, um, or also uh, drone technology to use on, on human subjects uh, for surveillance, these these projects don't really come to light um, unless workers talk about them and take those risks in doing so. And I think it's a really good development. For a long time, we've thought that people who work in the technology space are pretty single-minded. They're not really interested in politics. They don't care about organising and activism and that's clearly no longer true. And I think from that, there'll be, a, there'll be really rich contributors to the social movement to not just shape how technology is designed within those companies, but more generally how we make policy that affects everybody. Okay, Philip and Paul both have hands up, so you guys go for it. Paul, hi, and then we'll finish with, um, or they're both Pauls there, but um, <laughs> two Pauls. Paul, what are you excited about? 
Look, I'm excited about battery technology. I think we have a tendency to think in silos when it comes to technology. We have the internet over here. We have renewable energy up here somewhere. We've got you know, other things all in, but they are in fact all interconnected. Uh, a lot of the tech stuff, a lot of the internet stuff, uh, because become more portable, becomes things we don't plug into a PowerPoint, needs batteries. All of the developments in battery technology that are happening because of electric vehicles and, uh, and uh, solar power, all that sort of stuff. As soon as we get batteries in devices where my phone doesn't need to be recharged for about two or three months, where we can put devices on, in, on the roof or in the ceiling spaces, all the IoT things, things that don't need to be tethered to a PowerPoint anymore and might last months or years because of improvements in battery technology, that's gonna change everything. Excellent. Um, Paul too, Paul Wilson, what are you excited about? Hi, uh, look, I think there's, there's a lot of, st of stuff to be excited about um, and there has been for a long time, like as a, as a sort of a technology um, uh, Felix sort of character, I, I think uh, I'd love to be excited over nuclear technology and genetic engineering. I'm actually not because I think um, our society at the moment is putting those things in the hands of, of corporations and out of the hands of governments and making them extremely dangerous and leaving people as guinea pigs. And I'm starting, uh, as someone who's been involved with the internet for 25 years, I'm starting to see some of this stuff in the same way that we are, we are absolutely losing a sort of a sense of control by society over stuff that is in the hands of, of private companies acting as private companies do and, the, and society is, is absolutely a guinea pig. And I, I really think um, we're at a point where we're smart and savvy um, regulation, which is very different from what we have now, is going to be absolutely needed. And I think it's a call, a call to arms for everyone here to sort of get real about what the government is doing and how our interests are being represented because we have created something it sort of snuck up on us but it's it's sort of nearly as worrying as rampant genetic engineering um rampant uh, self-regulated nuclear power and i think it, it it could go pretty badly wrong i don't think it needs to because i think we can uh get uh get the regulatory thing happening but um as i tried to say in the in the chat at the beginning of the policy session that australia has got a really poor reputation if if rupert murdoch could own the could have owned the inter internet by now if that had been possible we would have allowed him to do it he would have walked in and and it would be his um, fortunately he couldn't but you know we've got other other means of monopolization that are being welcomed and mm -hmm. and or, or they're just happening around us without awareness by people who should know Great, Paul, and thank you for that very dark sense of excitement to end off, <laughs> yeah, end right. off the conversation. Um, oh, although I, I should also note, Paul did end up with hoverboards, which is, of course, what we're all most excited about. Hey, um, everyone, thanks for having us along. Um, this is the way that we try to get our heads around it every fortnight. You're all welcome to join us in our fortnightly tech talks. Um, we'll send out the, the links to that, to everyone that attends net thing. You know, we've got our lawyers, we've got our political campaigners and activists. We'd actually love to have more technologists in the room to help us sort of ground what we're doing with a little bit of maybe fact rather than the feels that I, I'm sure you see that I bring to the table. Um, but thank you very much and um, enjoy the rest of your conference. And um, Lizzie, back to work for you. Yeah, back to work for me. But thank you so much for having us. It's great. I love this community. I think you've got lots to offer in terms of guiding these kinds of policy discussions. And so I just echo that call that we need to get organised and start working on these things. And I think we've got a great future ahead of us if we can get that right. Thanks, everyone. I think you've got to go back to the main room now. All right. <laughs>